job. Um, uh, I think they made a lot of beautiful comments that I think segue brilliantly to our next topic on storytelling and narrative. I think that as we want to communicate, it's very important to build an articulate message. We have four great, yeah, please come on board. Uh, we have four great speakers, um, each with their individual takes on the ecosystem of how do you articulate with compassion what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, allow me to introduce Hunter. Would you please welcome the full panel up. And I think we have uh, one substitution, unfortunately. Um, uh, Eileen from Motorola is stuck in some sort of weather pattern, and so we uh, are welcoming Jeff um, in, in place. Hunter. Great. Well, uh, as you've said, uh, wonderful panel, the power of storytelling, narratives for, for impact. And as I've gotten to know the panelists, I think we're all uh, very lucky. They're not only thought leaders, but they're also entrepreneurs in their own right. And so uh, I expect uh, the next 40 minutes we'll have a chance to not just talk theory, but also practice. Um, uh, my name is Hunter Walk. I lead uh, YouTube's social change initiatives uh, focused on helping uh, nonprofits, educators, and uh, activists uh, accomplish their goals on the platform. Uh, if you want any additional information on there, you can go to uh, youtube.com forward slash nonprofits. There's also uh, some great best practices for how to use uh, video as social change. And, um, and since I'm only moderating, not, not talking, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, you can just email me, hunter at Google. Um, Let's go from uh, um, uh, my left to right. We'll do uh, quick introductions, and then we'll get into uh, some of the questions, and then wrap up with uh, a takeaway from each of our panelists. Um, so, Monica, did you want to sure. introduce Thanks, yourself Hunter. first? Um, my name is Monica Lozano. I'm the CEO of Impermedia, which is one of the largest Spanish language media companies in America. I'm Jeff Davidoff. I'm the chief marketing officer of the One Campaign. We're the anti-poverty advocacy campaign founded by Bono. I'm Francine Lafrac, and I started a company called Same Sky, a trade, not aid initiative in Rwanda and Zambia, and we make gorgeous jewelry, which I'm wearing. <laughs> <laughs> it is good, too. Um, I'm Paul Young, uh, the director of digital at, at Charity Water, and I, I didn't get to put my hand up before from where I'm from, because you didn't say Australia before, <laughs> but live here in New York City. Great. So. Um, Let's start out. People might be looking at this title and, and, and storytelling and trying to figure out maybe what that, that means for them. So I think a good way to, to start off might just be, well, what, what does storytelling mean in this context? And is it just a fancy word for marketing and PR, or is it really something different? Paul, I know that you guys do a, a lot of storytelling as part of Charity Water. Do you want to start off? Yeah, I mean, for, for us, it's at the, the very core of what we're trying to do uh, because when we think about our business, we're, we're trying to build a grassroots movement to solve the world's water crisis. And we really are a digital startup. We're only five years old here in New York City. Uh, our model is completely different to how the nonprofit sectors work to date uh, in that we're all individual. We do 75% of our funding through digital channels. Uh, but at the, at the power, right at the core of what we're trying to do is build an epic brand. We want people to, to love Charity War, to love the experience of being a part of our brand. Um, there's a great Christoph quote from a few years ago, Nick Christoph, about how there's brands of toothpaste peddled with more sophistication than all the world's life-saving causes. And we fundamentally believe that. So we think that investing time, effort and energy in storytelling, which drives brand, which drives <laughs> a huge affinity from our supporters, will give us the long-term reach we need to, to solve this thing, to get every person on the planet clean drinking water. I think another important piece of this is um, who is a messenger. Mm -hmm. And so very often, storytelling that is most powerful is when it's relevant, it's authentic, it's unique to the consumer that you're trying to reach. It really comes from within the community. And the important partners to effective storytelling are those trusted voices, the intermediaries, the NGOs, the nonprofit community, some of the companies that we heard from earlier. But what's really most important in impactful storytelling is the authenticity of the voice and whether or not you can capture that and it really becomes sort of the metaphor for the larger community that you're trying to reach. Uh, that's a great segue to something that uh, I, I know Francine has focused on, which is making those voices incredibly tangible, uh, li literally tangible to uh, consumers. We work with 85 of the most courageous women that survived the Rwandan genocide and are HIV positive, and many of whom were raped. And we want to tell you a story about reconciliation. We want you to buy a bracelet, and the bracelet is a ribbon 
to the cause. It's a ribbon to knowing Speciosa and her story. When you buy a bracelet and you know that now she has electricity in her home, you feel good about shopping. You feel authentic as a person. You feel more correct. And it's amazing what shopping can do. The fact that you can shop and you can actually be a philanthropist by shopping is a great feeling. And why can't we lift women out of poverty through telling the story about them and buying their products? It's more correct and they're handmade and it makes us feel good as people. When I go into my drawer in the morning to look for a piece of jewelry and I find a bracelet and I know that Bridget made it, I feel better about myself when I wear it all day. I feel closer to Bridget. And I believe that we can all share this amazing feeling and be more correct as people. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, when we were talking earlier, you know, you, you started off by introducing and saying you were more, you know, in the, in the content business than coming at it and saying I'm from the you know, social good. You know, you're starting with the story. How has, how has that impacted yeah, absolutely. your work? You know, it's interesting. I was talking with a group of uh, graduate students at Notre Dame about a month ago, and I said when I was sitting in their seats about 100 years ago, uh, everything they taught me was wrong. Then marketing was about attitudes and feelings and your emotional affinity to a brand. And honestly, I don't care what anybody thinks anymore. All I care is what they do. Um, and we're in the storytelling business that to drive behavior. It was interesting listening to the prior panel talk about, you know, the, the, the value of outcomes. Uh, one of the areas where I think do-gooders have suffered is from focusing on inputs, not outputs. If I tell you what the problems are, that's an old world issue. If I tell you all the money that's needed, that's an old world issue. If I tell you all the good that's been done, or the lives that can be saved, or the positive outcomes, then you are, you're buying into that. And really, a lot of what we do at one, I, I think of it as a sort of Trojan horse. Look, I, I came from the for-profit world. So I think back two and a half years ago, before I came to one, I, I hope that I wasn't a bad man, but I certainly <laughs> wasn't very engaged in or interested in the issues of poor people halfway around the planet. Uh, and I think now a lot of my job is how do I reach the me of two and a half years ago, or probably more accurately, the me of 22 and a half years ago. <laughs> and it's not by saying, oh, here's this terrible problem, isn't this terrible? You're a terrible person if you don't help with this terrible problem. It's about showing outcomes, and it's about showing the impact that you can have. And it is honestly a relentless focus on behavior. I have to constantly watch myself and my team not to fall back into old habits of, hey, what do you think about this? Or why don't you have a, we are one click away from almost every decision you make in the world today. Um, except, you know, like, I'm not asking you to buy a car, okay? <laughs> but the things that we need you to do, it's literally one click away. I, I'm convinced, and we're convinced, that a string of good behaviors will change the way you think over time. But the old world model of trying to change your thoughts that would proceed in action, I think, is yesterday's news. So, so Monica, you're, you're, in the, you're in the media industry. Do you use the same metrics for any of the social change goals that you use to measure the popularity of other content? Is it, do you approach it in different ways? How, at the end of the day, what's your dashboard look like for these sorts of questions? I completely agree with a focus on outcomes. And so you can look at some of the typical metrics that a media company might use, um, length of time, consumer engagement. At the end of the day, the most important thing is, are you able to change behaviors? And one of the things that, in fact, some of the people in this room can help us figure out how to do better is actually how do you, what are the measurement tools for measuring um, changed behavior in the consumer that you're trying to reach? Um, some of the work that we've done is very comprehensive, and I can go into all of the very much related to what we heard about earlier. It's not a single solution. It's business working with the policymakers, with the nonprofit environment, with um, community-based organizations. And if you can create a comprehensive tool that is actually deeply engaging and speaks to the needs, is, is relevant to the consumer base that you're trying to reach, you can actually move the needle. We did some work where we had a, a pre-measurement tool, a post-measurement tool, and actually around the area of digital literacy, we were able to identify actually change behaviors. Not only did I learn something, but I actually acted differently after I learned that information. And that, I think, is the most important thing. So the way in which we can collaborate around measurement tools to effectively determine whether or not you're not just doing something important and something interesting and something good, but at the end of the day, you've empowered the individual to think differently and to act differently around their and, life. And were those tools that you built in-house or worked with third parties on? 
There were tools that we built in-house, but we also took a lot of learning from what was already in the marketplace. So this is particularly in the area of, of digital literacy, and it comes out of some work that we had done with the Knight Foundation. And what the Knight Foundation um, found, a commission that I was a part of, is that healthy communities require access to information, that you can't talk about healthy communities and just say, well, are the schools effective, are people um, you know, having health outcomes that are appropriate, but you have to have access to information that is also empowering. And so this work that we did was not just around digital literacy, but actually taking um, those learnings and being able to help people identify ways in which they can improve the quality of life of their communities. Um, so we, it, was a, it was a conglomeration of work that we did in-house with nonprofit organizations, what other tools were out there. And what we found is that there was a lot of curriculum that is um, related to the device, but it doesn't actually teach you how to use those devices to effectively change your behavior, whether it's around um, financial aid, around college going, et cetera. So it was really a, con a, a combination of, of right. tools. And Paul, the, the first time we met, you, you told me started not about sort of how gorgeous the Charity Water website is, and it is, <laughs> or how wonderful the HD videos are, they are, mm -hmm. but um, at the end of the day, how you'd been able to drive down the cost to raise a, a dollar of donations to really just pennies. So how have you been able to uh, you know, merge storytelling with that call to action um, without ruining the story? Well, you see, we live in a world where uh, word of mouth marketing we know is the most powerful form of marketing. And for Charity Water, that's at the core of what we're trying to do. One of, one of the big ideas we have, the way our charity started, was with a birthday party. And we asked people to give up a birthday and ask for donations instead of gifts. Very simple idea, everyone in the room can do it, everyone in the room can get it. When you give up a birthday, the 10 people you ask for a donation are the 10 people you influence most in the world. It's your immediate family, your significant other, your best friends, it's not a random guy in the street. But if we give you amazing stories to share, then you're going to pass that on to all your friends. You're going to impact them with it. And I'll watch a 15 minute video if a friend tells me it's great. If you interrupt me with a 30 second video and I'm trying to read a New York Times article, I hate you. That's the digital world we live in. So Francine, the, we're, we're talking about the stories, but this is against the backdrop of you know, what, is, what is an ever shortening attention span. Great, I care about this today, tomorrow I care about something else. You're, you know, you've dedicated your life to working on some very substantial issues. They're not solved by just uh, something going viral over the course of a week. How do you imbue that into the work that you do? How do you keep people's attention and get them to take an action, not just in the moment, but to care over the course of their lives? Well, um, I think that at Same Sky we really try to bring out the best in people because we share the stories of our artisans. When you buy a bracelet, it comes with the signature of the artisan. We share the story, and if you want, you can send her an email. You can get her progress. You can know how her life is is progressing and you can become more engaged in her life and by doing that you want to tell your friend and you want to tell others around you do you know where this bracelet was made hey it was made in Rwanda and people look at you and it's like can you believe the talent and how beautiful it is and we're trying to sort of upgrade the story. We want people to realize there are, there are such talented people all over the world and all they need is a chance. Mm -hmm. And we want people to, to become part of this community. So we constantly give them updates. For instance, when the Rwandan genocide anniversary is, we ask people on Facebook to post pictures of themselves wearing bracelets. And we get so many people and they love to do it and they're smiling and they're happy and they have a group of friends over and many people even enjoy hosting home parties where they have jewelry parties where they tell the story of the artisans and they want to sell and buy the jewelry and it's 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 just a wonderful community that we've been able to build and we see that it brings out the best in people and people have a great time and I want to mention that we have men's cufflinks we don't want <laughs> men to feel like they're not included in this conversation men are very much part of same skies world so it's great. I mean, I would have gone into sort of this panel thinking a lot about storytelling is an authority dictating the narrative. But what I'm hearing is it's about putting 
facts information out there, but allowing your community to take that narrative and make it their own. Is, yeah, is that also what you see at one? We're asking people to be advocates, right? So we're asking people to go out, and whether they do it digitally through their social media, they do it in person with their friends, to say, you know, here's this issue that I care about, and, and I think you should care about it too. Well, somebody's going to ask a question. Somebody, or somebody's going to say, yeah, well, I don't think that's true. Or what about our problems here in the U.S.? Or what about, people are going to ask questions. We owe it to our activists to arm them. We always think about it, what Bono would say is like, well, how about the jerk in the pub, right? Like, what are you going to say to that guy? And it's so much about your point about feedback. Um, I think in the old days, we would have people who were doing things for us, and we did little to report back to them. And that feedback loop, and it came up in the, in the, in the, prior, in the prior session as well, Feeding back to the people who are part of our proposition is how we owe it to them, and it's how they stay more engaged. And the more, it's just like anything else, the more confident you are in it, the more likely you are to talk about it. And there's incredible power of that. And the only other thing I wanted to throw in is that, as far as keeping in touch, is the, everything's great about social and mobile except for one thing, which is there's a cr tremendous demand to feed the beast. There is a nonstop content demand. Uh, once you wrap your head and your heart around that, it's it, you can do it, um, but you have to be there every day. And so ve velocity of storytelling is as important That's, as the story itself, yeah, being there. It, it isn't like the once a year, here's my epic piece. But I also think it, it you, you have to think of um, what feeds this content machine, and it really has to be a, 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 a group of, of sources. So there's the user-generated content, there's the storytelling that comes from the consumer itself, there are partners, there are NGOs, there are trusted voices, there are brands, there are traditional media companies. I think the, 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 the compendium of a variety of content sources is really important. It can't just be those that are told by friends and family. It really needs to be, I think, this wraparound. And I continue to believe in today's day and age that um, trusted voices, those credible voices, are the ones that will emerge. And they don't have to be just from traditional media companies. Um, in certain communities, those are actually very important in terms of delivering the message. But the nonprofit environment, some of our companies as well have you know, very important content. So, I do think that the, the sources of content today are probably more um, diverse than they ever have been. That's a, that's a great transition to the question. Well, when people are approaching this, the storytelling or when you see it within your own organizations or um, uh, peer, peer groups, what are some of the mistakes or misconceptions that people have about effective storytelling? Maybe, uh, Monica, from the perspective of um, uh, reaching underserved communities, uh, do people feel like, well, there's if there was if there was interest, there'd be there'd be content. Uh, do they feel that uh, uh, look at the group as being uh, too uh, uh, homogenous when it's really a diverse set of voices? How have you approached the the question of storytelling? So I think the most important thing is relevancy and and um, the unique aspect of the consumer that you're trying to reach. If the content feels like it is relevant to your consumer, as if it's coming from on a community that is similar to theirs, the last thing you want is somebody who's very authoritative, who says, you know, this is my message and I want you to learn it. Um, if you can build from the bottom up and, and behave and act as if you're part of that community and that you're actually embracing those, those voices that are um, uh, you know, sort of relevant within, within that market that you're trying to serve, I think that's the most, in thi most important thing. Um, legitimacy, authenticity, relevancy, grassroots nature. I mean, you can't tell these stories from the outside. They really have to be told by people that you trust and in a way that is actually very um, relevant and, and understandable to that group. So, Jeff, another misperception is sometimes people feel, well, if you happen to know George Clooney or Bono, you can tell a good story. You can put them in front of a camera. You don't even have to have, they don't even have to talk. An audience will come. That is true. <laughs> um, and, and you guys obviously have <laughs> been lucky enough to involve a number of celebrities in your campaigns. What do you do if you don't have a celebrity on board for your story? Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, it's, it's the thing I worry about the most. Um, I came from the for-profit world, and I'm really lucky at one that almost everything I had at the best marketing organizations I ever worked at in the for-profit world, we have at one. We have a super talented team, um, and we have the, the money and the ability to do great creative work. What we don't have is a media budget. So what I lose sleep over every day is scale and reach. And you, I learned quickly, you can't do this thing where you just make some piece that you think is great, whether it has celebrity in it or not, and then sort of hope it will distribute. 
or light a candle and hope it goes viral. Um, we actually do everything reverse and work out the distribution first and then custom do the creative based on the distribution. Sometimes that'll be a broadcast model where you work with broadcasters who not surprisingly are interested in pieces that include their talent, okay? Um, if you're gonna do it online, the, the phrase that we're working with now is social by design. You can't take something that was really looks and feels and actually is a commercial and then hope to push it virally. But you can make things that at, the, at their heart, at the, the center of their creative, is something that is shareable, is something that is inherently social. And that will have its own sort of grease and momentum to it. We design and create in a certain way for Facebook. We design and create in a certain way for Twitter. We design and create in a very different way for traditional broadcast. But the, the, the message and the learning is, is that we have to worry about distribution first because that, you know, if they ask that existential question, if a PSA falls in the woods and nobody heard it, did it exist? The answer is no, it didn't. Um. Well, Francine, I'm excited because we're only 90 minutes into this and it seems we already have some controversy. On the last panel, a gentleman said that consumers don't care. They, you know, for the most part, it's lowest price. And you've obviously built a company around believing that consumers do care. Well, I, yeah. So, I, so yeah, so what's, I just, where's that I believe so strongly in the ethical shopping movement. I believe that if you have a compelling story and you bring out the good in someone and you connect them to something that makes them feel good, that they will want to share that feeling with others. And I believe that we're on the cusp of this. And even though we've gotten an addiction to cheap products, um, I you know, I feel like, again, if we start to buy handmade products made by women and that you know by buying a bracelet you can change a woman's life and you can, you can feel the impact of that, I just truly believe that, you know, that um, more brands are getting involved in this. When you pass H&M, they, they have a whole cause marketing campaign for HIV. So many of the luxury brands are connecting, and it's, it's celebrities who care about, you know, have social causes. And, you know, so I believe that this is, this is here to stay, and I believe that in this crowded marketplace, something that makes you feel good is something you're going to stick to and you want more and more of that feeling. So I feel very strongly that we're here to stay and it's, we're getting stronger and stronger. Great. And, and Paul, I'm going to turn you into the defender of social media. Some people say in storytelling, well, oh, great, so at the end of the day, it's an effective story. You know, there's no value in that. So there's no value in a retweet. There's no value in a forward. It's just another thing whiz, whizzing by. Is there a misperception around the role of social media in storytelling? I think too frequently people are measuring the wrong things. You know, I love the quote, viral is an effect, not a strategy. If you're thinking about views and you're thinking about pushing a video out, particularly, or a story out, often, uh, especially in the cause world, people are thinking about the immediate response. How many dollars did it generate? How many people pulled out a wallet because of that video right then? And one of the things I love about this panel is I often feel like I'm the only guy in the nonprofit world who really cares about customer experience. But there's a lot of difference I see here. But ultimately for me, storytelling is customer experience. Most giving around the world is you show me some story that impacts me for a moment, you get 20 bucks, I get a tax receipt, and at the end of the year, you ask me for more money. I walked to work on December 28th this year, I got seven different fundraising appeals, which just reminded me I could give from causes I connect with. What I'm trying to do with storytelling, what we're trying to do at Charity Water, is help every donor see their impact. We take photos and GPS coordinates of water projects that are built. Last September, we uh, got 1,000 people to get 10,000 of their friends to donate, to together pay $1.2 million to fund a drilling rig in northern Ethiopia. Since then, we sent a team to Ethiopia to do a live video of the first well that that drilled, just for those people who'd already given, and we didn't ask them to give again, we just showed them it. Right now, we're working on building a Google map and having this thing tweeting, so that the people who gave and fundraised last year can see this thing and see their impact for years to come. And that's significant tech resources from a small team, we got 30 people, significant resources, we sent our CEO to get the cool video from the ground. But the people who saw their impact, not only will they have a great customer experience, we think we'll unlock a spirit of generosity in them that will stick around for ages. My friend's seven-year-old daughter did this. I, I couldn't agree with it. And the work you guys do is really awesome. If I had a dollar for some time, for a time, everybody said to me, have you seen the charity water site? <laughs> yes, for the record, I have seen it. Um, but you know, you can give that feedback. It doesn't have to be all the way at the end. You do that magical thing where the well is built. But you know, we just ran a program. We were um, pushing our advocates to, to reach out to the G8 leaders. So we have a, a big online audience and we were looking for a way to bring it to life in the real world. So we built this robot called the Street Tweeter that takes <laughs> tweets and spray paints it 
on the ground mm -hmm. in the real world. And we did it on Pennsylvania Avenue running it to the White House, and we also did it on literally on the route to Camp David. And part of the feedback loop was this robot would also take a picture of the tweet and geolocate it through Google Maps and bounce it back to you through your Twitter feed so you could feed it right away. So that was a that was a, a feedback loop from an input, right? It had nothing to do with the actual outcome of the G8 at the time, but we had a magical response from our activists because when they could see what they did, they took an action in the digital world that came to life in the real world that bounced back to them in the digital <laughs> world. Their sharing of that was crazy good. Wow, so I'm, uh, these, these are great examples, but I'm hearing, I'm hearing robots, I'm hearing <laughs> Google games, Maps mashups, I'm hearing video. Yeah. This is very different than just uh, uh, the copywriter uh, you know, uh, with some great pros. So what, what are your organizations thinking about or what should organizations be thinking about in terms of skills, roles, capacity to be digital storytellers that uh, weren't on the org chart a decade ago? Well, you know, clearly just the, the digital literacy and, and the kinds of things that we were talking about. I don't, I wanted to actually sort of, there was something that was said, and I'm not going to answer this question, but um, I'm sorry. But, you know, because I think about sustainable change and impact, which is one of the things that came up in the prior panel. And so these sorts of things are important in terms of creating awareness and be able to engage people. But to actually change the, the life of the consumer that you touch every day, that is really hard work. And that takes you know, a long-term commitment and to understand all the levers that go into you know, what are the things that are important in terms of if I really care about the educational outcomes of my kids, and in this country we need to care about the educational outcomes of our children, how do you actually engage people over the long term to, to think about that, to play a role in that, to understand the different ways in which they can influence that. So I would just encourage us as we're thinking about you know, this panel and storytelling to really think about long-term sustainable impact at the individual level. And, and not just in terms of motivating them to get involved, but to actually thinking about you know, how do I empower myself, my family, my community to actually move forward for the betterment of, of a broader society. Okay, I'm not letting the panel off the hook, Sorry. though, on the question, because we <laughs> promised that we'd be both strategic and tactical. So what should people be thinking about in terms of building capacity within their organizations? Yeah, you, you have to be in love with digital, social, and mobile. You have to be. Um, and there's a difference, right? I was having this conversation with someone last night between sort of old guys like me who have embraced it over time versus kids who've grown up with it, and it is sort of native to them. And there's something really magic in the young communicators for whom thinking of things that are, that are shareable is always first in their mind. Um, and the other thing is really about tone and storytelling. Um, we just have a very strong point of view about, uh, like the reason that I'm at one is I wanted to work at a place where uh, the values of the company would line up with my personal social values. That's well, and that's whatever, but that isn't a reason why anybody else is going to join. And the do-gooder world in general, my view coming from the for-profit world, is that we spend an awful lot of time talking to ourselves, talking to the people who are already under the tent. Well, you're already in the tent, thanks. They're, the coffee's free, but my job is to bring more people into the tent, and it's not by being earnest, and it's not by sharing my personal transformation. It's about interrupting them in their lives with entertainment, with fashion, with music, with whatever they happen to be interested in, and at that point of intersection, giving them a fast, easy way to take an action right away. And then that can be the start of something else and something else. I describe it all the time. It really is sort of like the Trojan horse effect. So the people who are most valuable to us are kids who are growing up digital, social, mobile, mm -hmm. and people who understand that the way to reach out to other folks is not to tell their own personal story of transformation, but to be creative and interrupt people where they are in their lives. And Francine, do you see similar moving from uh, uh, Just World to you know a very product driven? You know, at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're selling something, right? Yeah, and, and it has to be beautiful, and people have to want it. Uh, you know, I believe in this um, model of trade, not aid, but I believe in it being sort of a barbell. On one hand, you need to go to train the artisans and make sure they're doing a good job and they can scale up. But at the same time, if you haven't created the marketplace, if you're not selling those products, you're not doing anything for those artisans. I've had people come to me with bags of, of stuff that they had developed in different African countries. And I looked at them and I said, what did you do? You've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's no marketplace. 
it is so crucial to be out in the marketplace every day, to be, you know, to go to the Neiman Marcuses and the DKNYs and the Tory Birches and find partnerships with them and show your product in so many different ways, not only online and at home parties, but to co-brand with all these other retailers because you need as many outlets as possible because that's how I'm taking care of my artisans, by giving them a marketplace. They love the fact that celebrities wear our jewelry. They love the fact that we've sold over 35,000 pieces of jewelry. They love the fact that people care about them a world away. But it's just that heavy lifting of doing it every day and realizing it's not about coming out and training artisans and then sort of what I call guilt shopping. This is guilt-free shopping because you're buying something beautiful that's changing someone's life. So it's it's really a compelling story. And, and that's what I so, have to say. So, Paul, so Paul you, you came from a digital agency background. Mm -hmm. So you were practicing these skills professionally mm -hmm. uh, and then moved over to the Charity Water site. As you have built out your team, do you, do you think anybody can come straight, you know, straight from school into cause marketing and know these things? Or do you need to take the sojourn, learning, learning the tricks of the trade, you know, selling consumer goods, selling cars, as yeah, Jeff said. It's a, it's a fallacy that age of individuals matter, and, and I am a millennial, I'm a digital native, I'm one of the youngest in the room, I think, but I, I think that's a fa <laughs> fallacy. All my background prior to Charity Ward was working with very large organisations, trying to help them make the cultural change they need to make to talk to people using the internet like they're people, and that's nearly impossible. It's really, really hard for them. Now, I landed at Charity Ward, it was my favourite charity before I worked there, I actually found them because of this idea of giving up a birthday, and I've found the best creative team I've ever seen and a CEO and founder who is our chief storyteller is extremely charismatic and will, I have to fight him to not do more stories every year. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be great one day we can just send him, send him to Africa and bring back stories. Uh, I've never seen that creative team, so I think if there's some, one thing that I could take away, it's, it's who is your chief storyteller? Do you have this skill set in your organisation? And are they empowered to go out and make great work? We actually, yes, there's stuff happening every day, but we get that from a 1,000 people who are fundraising for Charity Water right now. We probably focus on four to five big stories for the year. And um, I've never seen that in corporate America, and, and frankly, for years, I haven't seen. I've seen about five interesting pieces of content from corporate America. Good, good transition to the to the wrap up. So I heard your your takeaway is lots of stories, but who is your chief storyteller, and focus on the the few that you can gain traction on. There you go. Fantastic, uh, Francine. Do you have a, a takeaway for the? Uh, well, I think there's the authenticity and transparency. You, you've got to get directly to. You know, you have to know the story that you're telling is real and you have to care about the people and you need to really know that their lives are improving by how you're caring about them. Our artisans earn 15 to 20 times the average wage and that's a pretty compelling story. Wow. Jeff? Yeah, I think that my takeaway is that it's about outcomes, not inputs. Don't fall into the trap of, of talking about inputs. Um, and for sure, it's about behaviors, not attitudes. Um, we could spend a, a million years and a million dollars trying to research what people think, but at the end of the day, all that matters is what people do. And that our experience in terms of getting people to take action is to not fall into the trap of being earnest, but aggressively go out and there's sex appeal to doing good. Um, at the end of the day, I will feel like I've accomplished something if the coolest kids on a college campus are talking about doing good. And it's not impossible. I mean, you guys do it, right? Definitely. And we've got small pockets of doing it. And I just worry sometimes that uh, our ambition is too low and that we think that because we're doing good, we're in this small and insular community. And it's not true. And that's certainly not true of millennials. Um, so don't fall short. I would just say um, incorporate as many voices as possible into the storytelling. It's not just us telling those stories that we gather, but making sure that you incorporate as many voices as you can to make it as authentic as possible. Um, that the measurement is, is ultimately the most important thing. How do you change behaviors and what are those outcomes? Measuring impact on the ground and making sure that you've um, identified who your consumer is and targeted them with the appropriate messages and distribution tools. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been very informative, and uh, hopefully the uh, crowd here can join me in, uh, in again, great kickoff.